Neil Ganju from USGS at Woodsall Oceanographic Institution. Have you heard that story about Jimi Hendrix and his Monterey Pop Festival? They're arguing about who was on last. He had to go first. And Jimi Hendrix said, well, if I'm going first, I'm going to pull out all the stops and basically make such a big show of it that none of you are going to want to follow me on. And that was the day he lit his guitar on fire. Anyway. Um, so it is really humbling to be here. You guys can hear me okay in the back? Is it too loud? Okay. Um, the group of modelers that are in this room who have been working on this stuff for decades are, have been my inspiration, even though I've never been to a systems. And I'm not a geomorphic model, per se. The work that you'll see um, on some of these slides by people in this room has really been embedded in all of my work um, from the beginning for a couple decades now. Um, so if you have code to write and you're busy, I'm going to give you the key messages now and you can go back to writing your code. I know debugging code is much more interesting than anything I'm possibly going to say. Um, and you've all heard all the silly quotes about models. I'm going to add the final quote that all of us can use, which is all models are useful, even the bad ones. And um, take that and don't use any of the other quotes. Um, I'll also say, remember to recast your model output into usable metrics for folks. You can't just give um, surface plots of things. You need to start distilling metrics. And then lastly, move outside of your comfort zone. And this is kind of one of those interface things. Be that interface between yourself. Is that me? That's not me. Um, be that interface between yourself and the folks who are going to use your models to make decisions. So kind of move outside your comfort zone. So initially when I put this talk together, it was not going to be about the trichotomy, but this is something that's been on my mind for a few years. Folks have written about this. So Pat Weiberg and Sergio Fagarazzi had a nice paper that implicitly talks about this. And most of us in the room know about these different dichotomies and trichotomies in modeling. In salt marsh modeling specifically, there's a trichotomy between the engineers and the top there, the geomorphologists who get Rodin's thinker, you're welcome, and the ecologists who are largely um, building empirical models. And these three groups kind of operate separately. There's some people who bridge those things, such as you know, Julia Mariotti's work bridges these, Pat Weiberg, Sergio Fagarazzi, uh, a couple other folks, but not a lot of bridging of these three, um, these three disciplines. So I'm going to be talking about them. One of the things that's on the trichotomy is philosophy. Uh, I technically have a minor in philosophy. They didn't actually write it on any of the degrees, but I took enough classes to have a minor. And one of my last classes was philosophy of science. And this book on the left deals with the epistemology of science and specifically in, and also in modeling. Uh, there's a whole breadth of literature on the philosophy of modeling and how the information we generate with models becomes knowledge, just like a scientific experiment in a lab or anything else. And the key is this concept of conformation, which is that a model isn't representing the real world. It's conforming to one aspect of the real world. And you should try to always keep that in your mind. And the philosophers actually consider everything a model. Language is a model. So once you kind of feel that way about models, it really frees you up and not you don't have to worry about what people say, all the negativity around modeling. And lastly, I wanted to point out this volume from about 20 years ago that was formative in my work. A lot of the folks in the room here were in that volume. Um, there's a lot of great papers in there if you've never seen it. OK, so we're going to talk about the engineering perspective. So I'm an engineer by training, civil engineering for all of my degrees. And it's kind of focused on deterministic modeling, uh, mass conservation, and kind of physical understanding. So I was hired by the USGS 20-something years ago to work on constraining sediment budgets to salt marshes. Uh, and specifically carbon, dissolved organic carbon, particular carbon. So we went out, we put hydrodynamic instruments, optical sensors, and we're trying to constrain how sediment is moving in and out of a marsh complex that you can see on the bottom right there. This is Browns Island. It's at the confluence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta. And on the top right there, you can see the kinds of measurements we make, right? So these are process-based measurements of water fluxes, sediment fluxes, looking at the external forcings, tides, subtidal forcing from winds and low pressure systems. And then we use that model to build geomorphic models and, and hydrodynamic models to constrain those sediment budgets and how that influences geomorphology. Um, so ROMS, and actually this was, I completely forgot it was ever called CSTM, the Community Sediment Transport Model, but that was the model that I used for my PhD work to look at the geomorphic evolution of San Francisco Bay. 
So on the right side there is observations of bathymetric change um, over 20 years on the top, and then my modeling result at the bottom. And what I tried to do was kind of constrain the skill over depth ranges because the model was so terrible. And if you just do a pixel by pixel comparison, you're going to get a scatter plot that's just a big sneeze that showed we were basically right about 60% of the time of erosion versus deposition, which I guess is better than a random guess. But we tried to use uh, Briar skill score over depth intervals to give a little more realism. And as you can see, uh, I was doing poorly or worse in about 50% of the domain, and I was only doing well in about 20%. Uh, and those of us in the room who've ever worked on an estrogen geomorphic model know that there is no estrogen geomorphic model that does a good job of predicting geomorphic change. We haven't done it yet because the bed is complicated, the external forcing is complicated. We just can't really do it. I also attempted to come up with a metric. It was called the estrogen geomorphic number. Has anybody ever heard of that number? Raise your hand. Nobody. That, it went nowhere. It was a useless metric, but I tried. I tried. And it, it's actually, I mean, it's a ratio of sediment load and accommodation space to forces that are pushing sediment out, but yeah, it doesn't, didn't work. All right. Now you guys, the exploratory geomorphic modelers, the, the heart of, uh, of salt marshes, right? So... I went to Woods Hole after that. I was working in San Francisco Bay. I moved to Woods Hole, uh, and I started doing inner shelf modeling with ROMs and CSTM with Chris Sherwood, who's my supervisor. And I got pulled into salt marsh work with Matt Kerwin peripherally. And so I started reading the literature, and there are all these exploratory modeling papers that were, you know, the one on the left is a meta analysis of several salt marsh models, looking at where they convert from marsh to subtitle under different sea level rise and sediment concentration scenarios. And on the right is another model that's accounting for tide range and sea level rise. And these are really cool models. They explore different behaviors of systems. But I was troubled by the lack of, of a sediment budget, right? These are just kind of imposing a sediment concentration with no knowledge of where that sediment's coming from, where it's going. And that troubled me as a, as a process-based modeler who's measuring sediment budgets. And I thought, well, how can this possibly be right if you haven't constrained it? But of course, those pictures on the right really touched my, the geomorphologist in me. Uh, and then other papers came out from folks like Andrea Dalpos, Mark Brani, Julie Mariotti, that are again exploring this kind of parameterization of sea level rise and sediment to look at how salt marshes behave. And what you can see uh, specifically in both of these on the left is from the top left where you have high sea level rise and low sediment, you see conversion open water in blue. And on the bottom right, when you have copious amounts of sediment, low sea level rise, you get you know, vegetation expansion. Julio's work shows similar things where under most of the conditions you see in the United States for sea level rise and sediment load, pond collapse. So you have marshes expanding, open waterway, open water expansion, and loss of sediment. So with all this stuff in my mind, I thought to myself, okay, there's, there's a place for sediment budgets in this work to not just a parameterizing a sediment concentration, but constraining an actual budget to inform the evolution of salt marshes. So the hypothesis we started with is that if you measure a sediment budget in and out of a marsh, and again, I did this in California, but it wasn't tied to the geomorphic evolution. If you measure that sediment budget in and out, you can kind of aggregate all those little processes that we can't measure, right? We can't measure elevation change over an entire salt marsh. We can't measure um, how marshes are, you know, how scarps are falling into the water everywhere in a marsh complex very easily. But we can measure the flux in and out of a channel and then use that as an aggregator for all those withdrawals and deposits of sediment. So we started with this hypothesis. Well, if a marsh is stable or uh, expanding, then it should be importing sediment. If it's falling apart or deteriorating, whether that's from sea level rise, herbivory, sediment deficits, then there should be a net flux out. So to test that, we put instruments in eight, well, seven, one from the literature, um, eight sites around the country, left these instruments out for months to years to measure really precise sediment budgets. And what you can see on the right are these eight sites around the country and the shaded parts of the tide sheds behind every measurement site. And in orange is the vegetated part of that, of that tide shed, and the darker parts are the open water areas or the unvegetated areas. So what we found was the net sediment budget, which is on the y-axis here, um, was correlated pretty strongly with the ratio of the unvegetated to vegetated area in all those tide sheds. And the big thing you can see is that none of our sites was in a sediment surplus condition, even the one that had an estrogen turbidity maximum and had, you know, 70 milligrams, of, 70 milligrams per liter coming in on every flood tide still was in deficit when you account for sea level rise. The worst off one on the far right was five kilometers away, rapidly expanding um, open water and losing sediment at a kilogram per second, if you can imagine. 
But what this, came, what this told us is there's a mechanistic relationship between loss of vegetative plane, liberation of sediment, and sediment export. So now we're tying together those two perspectives. This metric we came up with, the UVBR, which is now a very useful metric, much better than the estrogen geomorphic number, um, has been really valuable because it's customizable. It can be on a pixel basis, it can be across a marsh unit, it can be across a whole marsh complex. So I'm not going to get in the, there's no technical stuff in this talk. This is technical I was going to get. But basically what we do is across the landscape, we can break a marsh up into individual tide sheds using LIDAR data. And then we use aerial imagery to classify every pixel as vegetated or unvegetated. And then we aggregate those up to give you a UVBR score for every unit. And then we can do this for um, tide range. We can do this for elevation of the vegetated plane. We can do this with other model outputs. So we've built a geospatial framework that you can bring any kind of data to for a marsh system, whether it's for management or for research, and it's on a kind of geospatially, geo geomorphically consistent basis. Uh, and I will say, if anybody's interested in this data, we've published it across the U.S., uh, well, across the Northeast on marsh units, and then across the entire U.S. for five years of Landsat, uh, and we have the forthcoming from 1985 to 2023 for Landsat at a 30-meter resolution. That's within pixel vegetated fraction. All right, so lastly, I'm going to talk about the ecological focus. Now, ecologists use these models, and has anybody heard of SLAM? Have you heard of SLAM? Anybody? Just a couple. Okay, that's good. Um, if everybody raised their hand, this talk would, be a, it would fall flat on their face. But SLAM is the model that every wetland manager uses to manage marsh evolution. Uh, it's a very simple, it's actually black box. It's not a community model. It's a private consultant, but they have deployed it throughout the United States on every, basically every federally owned salt marsh, which is most of the salt marsh in the U.S. It's a zero D model that they try to apply spatially, and all it accounts for is sea level rise, and it's a bathtub model that then does plant zonation as a function of that sea level rise and a very crude approximation of sediment supply. And the example here is from that same place, Browns Island, where I worked for, for five or six years. And the bottom left is the scenario with very high sea level rise rate, low sediment supply, and it's got that island turning into a mudflat. The issue is that this is at the confluence of the Sacramento San Joaquin rivers. It's right next to an 80 foot deep channel. There's no way that that marsh is gonna be a mudflat 100 years from now. It's going to be eroded away. There's going to be lateral, lateral change, open water expansion. So a priori, I know that this is, excuse my language, it's garbage. Nonetheless, if you look at that top right quote, the modelers who use SLAM will say, well, we do this because it's available. We've already run it, so we should use it. So right there, a little bit of realism. If people are going to use this model, then we need to understand what's in this model, what can it be used for, what can't it be used for. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And so on the bottom here, Plant zonation in these models comes right down to elevation. That's all that matters, elevation relative to sea level. So the dumbest thing, simplest thing I've ever done in my career is this matrix, and this is probably the most valuable thing I've ever done. It's just a simple matrix of elevation and UVBR, that, that open water um, expansion score. And basically what I did is I classified every marsh unit that we've worked in in these four boxes, and then it gives managers knowledge of what technique they can use to restore salt marsh. I'm not going to get into depth of this, glad to talk about it later, but the bottom line is, is you can map this on a landscape, and we've done it for all, almost all of the Northeast and all of Chesapeake Bay, which is 7% um, of the nation's salt marshes. Here's an example. So on the top right there, you can see a marsh unit in red that's in the middle of the open water area. It's got a very low elevation relative to the tide. It's got a lot of open water expansion. A manager might not want to devote the resources to restore that parcel unless there's, you know, salt marsh sparrow or some, some critical endangered species. On the bottom left, we have a restore parcel that's high elevation, but it's got some open water expansion. And it's right on the edge of the marsh forest boundary where they might expect transgression. That's a great parcel to restore because you've already got elevation capital and you have this boundary between the marsh and the forest. Um, so this is how we kind of give these results to managers to make our data uh, useful. We have to step across a line that maybe we weren't comfortable crossing before. Now another line that I've just crossed in Chesapeake Bay is exploratory modeling. So initially when I was modeling San Francisco Bay, I wanted to build a Brad Murray style exploratory model and I was quickly slapped and said you can't do that. That's not going to be something we can give to the Bay Delta you know, community. But I got to do it for here. So what I did here is I parameterized sediment export from that curve you can see up there. And then using kind of an approach like Jorge has done with barrier islands, 
I partition that sediment flux between open water law, uh, vegetated plain loss and elevation loss. And I can do a Monte Carlo and spread that out. And that gives me some time scales of how the elevation and the open water conversion change. And I can do that on an annual basis. And then the SLAM model, which has already been run for Chesapeake, we map that onto the same marsh units. And this is a project that we're doing with Audubon, which is basically trying to restore 25,000 acres of salt marsh in this area for the salt marsh sparrow, which is an endangered species that uses high marsh. So on the left here is a SLAM model mapped onto marsh units. The dark colors are basically low marsh or, or mudflat, which is undesirable habitat. The light brown is high marsh, which is desirable habitat. And on the right are the UVVR on those same marsh units where green is good, pink is bad. So in 2022, um, you can basically see, you know, there's some agreement about all that open water um, in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge center there. But when you step through, you know, a few decades, now you see really strong agreement between all that open water expansion in the middle in pink and all this conversion to low marsh that the SLAM model predicts just based on the bathtub. So right now you're giving the marsh manager a bathtub approach and a Mariotti style runaway open water expansion approach. So you've got two lines of evidence to tell you with certainty where you can expect to not be able to restore marshes and where you might. They are on, the, on that western part uh, where it's that beige color and you still have some uh, vegetated plain intact. And once, of course, you step through the 2070, it's all gone. So that's an, another dose of realism, that no model is going to tell you that those marshes are going to be here 50 years from now. So that's sad, but it's also a, a good check of realism. So lastly, all models, even SLAM, are useful. Uh, you can find the mechanistic connection between elevation and plant zonation and use that to your advantage. Um, I'd strongly encourage you, if, if you're not, if you're just presenting you know, maps of model output, you have to distill these into metrics that folks can use and put those onto a geospatial framework. And then lastly, just in the last few years, I've moved outside of my comfort zone working with managers and restoration people. And it's a little uncomfortable and it's a little, especially as a government employee where I'm not supposed to advocate or make policy recommendations, um, I am allowed to tell them how to use my models and how not to use them. And I find a lot of uh, value in that exchange. Uh, and with that, I'll stop there and take questions if I have time. Thank you. I have a mic. <laughs> I don't know what you're running for. <laughs> I think this one. <laughs> Thanks for a really nice talk. <clears throat> um, I was curious if in your sediment budgets, I've seen papers from Marco Morani and Brad Murray's group that there's a huge part of the elevation maintenance that's coming from organic contributions. So do, 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 does your modeling framework or the unvegetated vegetated ratio include sort of particular organic carbon or sort of the ability of the plants to build their own soil? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, that is usually a question I get from the biologists. So to be at SISDMS and get that question makes me think they're not crazy after all. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so we, we do account for that. So in, you know, this new model that we've come up with, this, um, this partitioning model, what it does is it, it's accounting for the existing organic material in the substrate, and it's exporting that. And then it's also accounting for what might deposit either from external sediment, inorganic, or actual uh, organic production and burial. And we have little knobs we can tweak. The bottom line is once you, if you do a sensitivity analysis to all those, those density and um, contributions, the general trends are still the same, which is reassuring. The, you know, the span can be bigger, but the general trends are the same. So that's a question I get all the time from the economists, because they claim that it's all organic material production. And I tell them, well, have you ever seen a 10 meter high marsh next to you know, the edge of the estuary? There's, there's lateral change, there's erosion. I take this one too, Mark. Yes, thank you for the very thoughtful talk. I was wondering if you could say more about your interactions, about how to use and not use your model with managers, policymakers. Yeah, so, so far, I only hear from the ones who, well, you know, this example from the Chesapeake um, is a good one where, you know, I kind of signed on to the project early. We didn't have any model results. 
they hadn't even kind of formulated how they were going to do this. And they said, would you be on our technical advisory committee? And I said, fine. And as we met regularly, um, I basically had to devote, you know, an hour a week to meeting with these folks online. And in that process, it was a slow nudging of what you can do with the model and what you can't. So there would be times where they say, hey, can we use the UVBR um, and project, you know, on an annual time step? And I said, it's not meant for that. I can't, I can't do that. I don't know what's going to happen a year from now. I can do these kind of gross bulk parameterizations. And what they did is they actually pushed me and said, well, can you just try? And that's where I came up with this, this partitioning thing. And I told them this is not something that I would, I, I would use or I would publish quite yet. It's an exploratory model, so I can't give it to you. But I said it can, you can use it internally and look at it and get an idea for where things agree and where they don't. So to do it, you have to be embedded very closely and willing to spend hours of your time to guiding them. Otherwise, they'll take it and run with it in a way that, yeah, you have no control. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, um, cool. Thank you for the talk. I'm curious, what kind of reactions do you get when you show the model that all the marshes are going to be gone in 50 years? Or anecdotally, what type of decisions have been made from this in your experience? Um, I've actually had a harder time in the opposite. So we, with the same model you see here, we, and it's actually, this is Sergio Fagorazzi's idea from our 2017 paper, was to compute a lifespan. And the stronger reaction I get is when I show a marsh unit that says it has like 500 years, people lose their minds over that. They say, we can't show that to the public because then they're going to say, why are you spending money restoring marshes? We've got 500 years. So it's actually the opposite problem I've had. Um, no one is surprised when you show them this. I mean, you know, this area has been degraded for um, almost 100 years now. That area has been converting to open water. So no one is surprised by this. It's the opposite when you say there's a parcel that's going to be here 500 years from now. That, and that's where, I, that's where I have to tell them you can't use this approximation for something that's 500 years from now because sea level rise rate is not going to be 5 millimeters per year 400 years from now. So it's going to be gone in an instant, right? So. That's my harder, harder problem. Nice. Heartening. Excellent. Thanks for the nice talk. So I wanted to give you, take you back on the metrics comment because that's a, it's a topic of interest to this community a lot. And you show an earlier metric that you develop, and I think you, you were hinting at the fact that it's not being particularly used. And then you show more special metrics. So I guess my question is, how would you change back? that earlier metric or what in your experience has made a metric usable? Um, that's a great question. I think, and I was a PhD student at the time, so I didn't have access to the, the managers and stakeholders the way I do now. I think I would have, if I, if I was a, you know, a PI or a, you know, a researcher who had the ability to go out and talk to people, I would have spent more time in some of those Bay Delta consortium meetings where folks are talking about the real problems and what they needed to know the geomorphic evolution for, so that I could have found a metric that would have addressed their specific questions. And really, in hindsight, their big question was, it, what is the suspended sediment concentration for delta smelt, this little fish that needs uh, optically cloudy waters to avoid predation? That was the big thing. So in hindsight, I should have spent more time on predicting optical clarity as a function of geomorphic change in different regions and come up with habitat metrics. That's what I should have done, but I didn't know. So I think talking to stakeholders early on before you start your modeling and while you're doing it helps you develop that metric. Thank you. Thanks.